Now, on the other hand, um, what wasn't so fantastic was that that first uh, debate was a debacle, but maybe that was also great for everybody to hear. Um, so if you look at your timeline, it is incredible. It's Wesleyan and Princeton and Cornell and Harvard and UCLA. And then, and then as if that's not big enough, Microsoft. And of course the pinnacle, Berkeley. Um, can you, so many of us in the audience, not me, but everybody in the audience, um, it, is kind of in the middle of their career, whether it's more, you know, if they're they're on the master's level or undergrad, trying to figure things out. And I love how you said that you feel like dropping out of high school and having to figure it out in the village, which sounds like fun actually, um, was helpful to you. Can you just take us a little bit through um, things that happened to you at Wesleyan or Princeton that you thought were impactful or maybe even a professor who was incredibly impactful for you? So, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I went off to college um, loving math, actually loving math. I, I told you I started doing math problems in my head when I was four, but I didn't think that math was a real profession. I didn't have any academics in my family. And so what do you, what do, you do with math? Well, you, I, I thought you could be a high school teacher, which is fine, but I, I didn't realize, you know, you could really have a career with math other than teaching it. Um, and I, I also really liked biology and my father wanted me to be a doctor. So here, you know, I, I went off to school and because I wanted to go to medical school, I had to take physics, even though I didn't think I'd like physics. And I took physics the summer after my freshman year so that I wouldn't have to ruin a whole year. And I fell in love. I just loved physics. And so I was just doing that for fun, but I kept thinking I'd go to med school, I'd go to med school. And you know, here I was doing math on the side, doing physics. I decided that I wanted to go to physics graduate school. And even though I loved biology, because really biology was not very quantitative at all at that time. Now, of course, biology is much more quantitative. And so I often recommend to young folks, oh, if you don't know what you want to go into, go into computational biology, which is going to change the world, you know. Um, but I, I just, um, I, I went off to graduate school in, and I did mathematical physics. And then you know, I went and I did postdocs in, in, um, in math and in physics. But during this time, I was really, I was following my, my passion. And I think that that's really, really important because I think um, you, you know, you, you imagine where you're going to be, but it's not, you know, it's often not where you land up. And so following your passion and, um, but not saying, okay, this has to be what I do for the rest of my life, but developing depth in certain areas. It's very important. You can't just be a dilettante. I mean, people say, oh, you did biology, you did physics, you did math, you did computers. Yeah, I did them over many, many years. So you, <laughs> one other thing about me is I work really hard. So, uh, you know, I, I have a very strong work ethic, which comes from my immigrant parents. Um, and you know, so, so I just think that during that time, I was following my passion. I thought, now I discovered academia, I want to be a professor. And so that's what I did. So a lot of people um, have to figure out what they don't want to do before they figure out what they want to do. You loved word problems, you loved math, but um, I guess you had the option of, of being a teacher. So that's kind of what happened. But was there ever um, on that path, you know, and like looking at the, you know, late 80s um, where or early 90s where you weren't sure where you had, you know, you came to a fork in the road um, because you have this incredible ability to make decisions. And so I think it would be really interesting to hear how you might have made a decision then. Okay. So, um... You know, I, I think a really important thing to tell yourself is that you are not closing a door forever. 
And the more you prepare yourself and you're broad, the more you can know that you're not closing a door. I mean, I came back to biology all those years later. I'm, you know, I've worked on cancer immunotherapy. And so you take your loves and you say, okay, not, not all of them now. So I looked at things and I said, you know, what, what am I finding most compelling? Uh, and how do I, one of the wonderful things about doing, um, you know, work in STEM is that you can actually leave yourself open to a lot of other things. So uh, training in mathematics, for example, can prepare you to go into computer science. It can prepare you to go into technology. It can prepare you to go into computational biology. And so um, just knowing that you are not really closing a door, but you're just not passing through that door right now because that's not the right door for you today. But you keep, you know, I keep these things that fascinate me kind of in the background until there's a time where I can actually participate in them. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. But. Yeah, interesting. So it makes me wonder when you're working and studying so hard um, on, you know, biology, mathematics, going to Cornell, Harvard, what did you do for fun? What did I do for fun? Okay. Well, and it's okay um, if you worked for fun, but just okay. Wondering. Well, you know, it's really funny because uh, I'm jumping ahead a little. But once I was at Microsoft and I was going to go to my first big exec meeting with Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer, and you know, they were taking I don't know, like a hundred, you know, people at a certain level and above off to, uh, you know, some fancy resort where we could have all and and they said to me, you have to put in your bio, what your hobbies are. And I said, I don't, I don't think I really have hobbies. And they kept saying, you have to put what your hobbies are. You, In her spare time, she enjoys. You must complete that. And so I put over working. And, <laughs> and that remained, and people thought it was so hysterical that that remained on my bio and my webpage for years. It's not that, you know, I, there are other things that I'm interested in. Actually, I love art. Um, and when I was younger, I thought about be becoming an artist. And I think actually becoming a scientist uh, is a lot like becoming an artist. Yeah. You, you know, your, your medium is different, but you create something. I mean, the thing that I loved about art was that I could create something. And, you know, I just, I have a different palette but I can create things now. So, so I think that, you know, what I do when I go among these different fields is I say, okay, I, I got this now, but there's something over there that's really interesting. And what enables me to move towards it is I can bring the things I have from this set of experiences over there to enrich the way I might look at something else. So I, I just, I, I really, I think sometimes we really worry ourselves and we say, you know, not I'm going through this door, but I'm closing that door. And I don't think that's a good way to think about it. I think it's, I'm not walking through that door today. I'm walking through this door today. Yeah. But that's not to say that I can't come back and do something at that door in the future. So I think that's that's quite insightful that you can make a decision, but that doesn't mean that you're closing a door behind you. Um, I am kind of curious. I, I don't know the story. Um, you must have had some kind of a social life because your husband is at Cal also. How did you all meet or where? I mean, you don't really. Well, this is my husband. second husband who's at Cal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, I did. I that was the village maybe, but yeah. Right. No, I did. I did have, I was like into punk rock, which was this thing at the time, you know. So I actually, <laughs> when I went to Princeton mathematical physics, I wore leather and chains and spikes, which was not <laughs> what they normally saw. I mean, this was, you know, this was the late seventies, early eighties, you know, um, 
when that was going on in some circles, it wasn't going on very much at Princeton Physics. But and, um, and you didn't dye your hair orange for the tigers. I I didn't dye my hair orange for the tigers, but I had really 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 long hair. I had really like I would sit on it if it you know and and I just wore these <laughs> it was just a little bit. It was a little bit bizarre. Um, I still meet people in the house sometimes who remember me from back then and say, what happened? And it's like, well, thank God I'm not this age and still dressing like that. That would be really sad. Um, but yeah, so I, I did have a social life. And actually, my current husband, who's wonderful, um, I actually met long before we got together. I met him in uh, a six-week conference in the in the Swiss Alps, in a mathematical physics conference in the Swiss Alps in 1984. And we didn't get together until many years later, until 1992. Um, but yeah, I do, I do have a social life. I do have friends. I love art. Um, I have a house in Boston that we designed. So I, I do, there are other things that I also really like. So I do have somewhat of a social life, but I also, you know, I, because I move into different areas, I don't get bored with my work. My work is always something different. And I really like that. Um, Jennifer, I, I, I just want to thank you for being so open and with us. And I just think it's always fascinating when you see your background and where all you've worked. Um, I think students have this image of what you have to do. And I just want everybody to know everybody has their path. Um, so, so thank you for sharing that with us. And I um, think quite frankly, you know, I used to go out and talk to girls in high school. Um, you know, when I was at Microsoft and, and, you know, what I would tell them is actually my path that was a little bit harder than some, you know, um, made me more persistent, made me less risk averse. And so I think that what can seem like your burdens can actually really be, you know, the core of your strength as you go forward. So to think, well, I came from this background, I can never do that. Sure you can, you're at Cal, you've already made it this far. I mean, you know, you've already done so much. You're yeah. here, you can do it. And by the way, I had the imposter syndrome, okay? I thought I wasn't any good. I thought the only reason I did well was because I worked hard. So, you know, you see kind of like first in my class and you think that must mean that I was confident. I wasn't confident. I had all the, you know, I, I mean, I just believed, oh, I, I got this far because I worked hard or, you know, and so I see that in so many other people and I want people to know their burdens actually have made them stronger and tougher and more likely to succeed. And, um, their insecurities, you know, just say thank you for sharing and put them on the on the back shelf. I mean, they're just, they're not reality. Okay, they're just not reality. Thank you. Thanks for sharing all that. Um, I wanted to give the class also a little bit of background and a similarity with you. Uh, th this class is actually not named after Isaac Newton uh, and gravity, by the way. It's Richard um, A. Richard Newton. And he uh, was a beloved dean of the College of Engineering, but he was um, a, a truly a Renaissance man, as I see you as being a Renaissance individual. He was an entrepreneur. Um, he helped found uh, Cadence. He co-founded Cadence. He was an academic at the same time. And gosh darn, people loved him. Um, and so it just seems fitting that you, as someone with an academic background and uh, and what you're doing right now is quite innovative that you're here and and you do emanate this, I don't wanna necessarily say love, but, but this appreciation for everybody. So so thank you. Um, well, I, and let me say one thing, I knew Rich and I adored him, I adored him. So when I got to Microsoft, I got to Microsoft in 1997 and Rich was on our external advisory board. So I met him in 1997 and he was 
he was just fantastic. He always had the best advice. He always, you know, the crazy things I wanted to do, Rich would encourage me to do, okay? I mean, in terms of doing things at Microsoft that maybe people at Microsoft hadn't done before. You know, Rich was someone who, who was a change maker, okay? Rich was himself and he encouraged that in others. Um, I am going to, well, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more since you mentioned Microsoft about what you did at Microsoft. And then I'm gonna mix it up a little bit. Often we wait until the end to have students come in and ask questions. Um, but uh, Rishi and Pranati and Swetha, I'm wondering if we can, um, after uh, Dr. Uh, so Chase, 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 thank you. Um, uh, talks a little bit about Microsoft. If you can bring some students in to ask some questions, so we can do that, and then we'll go back to the interview. Um, but uh, tell tell us a little bit. So when he was, you know, also there as an advisor, what were you doing at Microsoft? How did you get led away from UCLA? What happened? So uh, Nathan Mirvold was a classmate of mine from Princeton in grad school. And he was also the first CTO of Microsoft. In fact, um, my class had only 20 people in it at Princeton, the graduate class. And uh, five or six of them um, formed this little company that really hadn't done anything yet. And uh, Bill Gates met them. He thought they were really smart and he acquired the, the company which was just a dream really at that point, but it was a quarter of my classmates. <laughs> and so Nathan got it into his head that, oh, maybe I could leave academia and go to Microsoft. Now, remember, I was a professor of mathematics doing mathematical physics proofs. So, you know, wh why did Nathan get this into his head? I don't know, but anyway, um, so I went there because I wanted to do interdisciplinary work. And at that time, it was really hard to build interdisciplinary groups. Now a lot is interdisciplinary. That time it was really strongly discouraged. So I went there, um, what year was this? I'm, I'm getting a lot of questions here, but I'm gonna ignore them for now and then ignore come them, back. We'll go back through them. And then we'll go back. So, um, so anyway, uh, I think they were asking me what I wanted and I think I was supposed to ask for money. And I was, you know, I was a poor underpaid UCLA professor. <laughs> so it didn't occur to me to ask for money, but I asked, oh, can I have this many positions to fill? And can I, and, and they gave me all that stuff. And, um, and then I remember I appeared before Bill Gates. Um, he wanted to meet me and see what I was doing. And I gave him this talk on phase transitions and intractable problems in computing. They said to me um, when I was going there, they said, do you need any special equipment for Bill's conference room? And I said, no, just an overhead transparency projector because I still did slides by hand. And they said, you're gonna be the first person who has ever shown Bill slides by hand. <laughs> Everyone else used PowerPoint, this little product that Microsoft made. And I went in there and I did slides by hand. And, um, and I congratulated him for hiring a group whose results weren't going to pay off for 100 years. But in fact, Bill and Nathan were right and I was wrong. I learned about all this stuff, all these real world problems that we could approach in various ways. Also, the interdisciplinary groups we built. We built, I mean, I hired people in philosophy and anthropology and all these other strange fields. And in fact, the first group in fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics in AI was built in my lab because we brought together these folks. Um, very early after I got there, we hired a fields medalist, mathematician, very famous topologist, um, and Michael Friedman, and I taught him physics. <laughs> and we started doing um, a, a form of quantum computing that now, you know, Microsoft has this huge investment in quantum computing. I mean, really, really huge in quantum computing, but this was, you know, this was 1998. Okay, so people were not doing it. So we did that and we did the boundary of microeconomics and machine learning. And so we did all these things that were at the boundaries 
of different fields. And, and that was what we built. And then they turned out a lot of them to be incredibly useful to Microsoft as we were doing our products. So it is interesting hearing how you're talking. You're using we constantly. I know you put a lot of effort behind things. You have all these different people working together. I, I, um, I, I'm sorry to all the mathematicians out there, but you know, these ner nerdy mathematicians who really don't wanna to talk to anybody else. They just wanna solve their problem. I'm, I'm over generalizing. Then you said you have other people. How, how do you get everybody to work together when everybody does have a different language? How do you create a we? So um, first of all, it takes time. So you have to just have people mix. You have to have the mix kind of socially, essentially. The other thing is when I would think that an area was fertile ground. Oh, interesting that you take, talk about mixing socially, but go ahead. So when I would think that an area was fertile ground, I would talk to people about it and they'd be like, what are you, what are you talking about? And so then I would start working in that area. <laughs> And I would get other people to work with me because I'd make it look fun. And then I could step away once that was established. So we want to do that at such a large scale here at Cal. You know, we are building a new building that is going to be the home for computing, data science, and society. Yeah. You know, it's going to be the home of a very large part of EECS. It's going to be the home of statistics. It's going to be the home of the iSchool and all these folks who collaborate. And we're going to have the, the architecture is going to have these mixing places where people just over time, they're just having coffee, they're having lunch, and they start to talk with each other. It's not just learning the language of another discipline. It's learning what problems are important to them and why. Then you start to build true multicultures. You know, you, 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 you can learn another language without getting the culture of that language, or you can get the culture without even necessarily learning the language. You can partake of the culture. Yeah. So that is the kind of thing that I created on a smaller scale at Microsoft with the partnership of hundreds of people in my labs. And here, the scale on which we can do that at Cal is just, you know, um, it's unbelievable. So I really, I think of myself kind of like, at, both at Microsoft and here as an intrapreneur, change in a big organization, change in, right? And, and some of you who want to do startups, okay? Let me just tell you, if you're really successful, you might get acquired. And then all of a sudden you are going to be in a big company. <laughs> and, right? And I see people come into big companies and not thrive because they know how to be entrepreneurs, but not intrapreneurs. And okay. so it is really important to know how to thread that needle to innovate within a big organization. Um, you talked about different people. So let's get some different perspectives in. Juna, um, would you put your uh, video on and ask your question? Then we'll go to Peter. And it'd be nice to know where you are at the moment. Um, I'm right now, I'm at my parents' house. So I don't think I can turn on my camera. Oh, um, I'm okay. so sorry. I, I meant more like, are you in LA? Are you in Berkeley? Well, <laughs> um, right now I'm in uh, Orange County, which is in Southern California. And um, I will come and back. And Juna, what, what are you as a, as a student? What major are you? What year are you? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm an ECS major, and I'm in my fourth year. I'm actually graduating this fall. So, uh -huh. yeah. What's your question, Juna? All right. Um, so I was really intrigued when you talked about um, like discovering your passion in pursuing math and physics. So I'm wondering like when people talk about, you know, physics, um, everyone's like usually excited about the, um, like the conclusion, the results, the experimentation, but um, what is it really about the math um, or the process of leading to the result that you're passionate about? So, you know, to me, Math is kind of like poetry. 
Okay, and so um, if you have a physics problem, you want to abstract it so that you can do something mathematical with it. And, and physicists are really taught how to do this. Nobody hands you the model. You have to do it yourself. And that is actually something really useful when you do almost anything. When I am faced with something where I wanna understand ethical decision-making and using AI, it's like, okay, which, which parts of this have to go into the model and the algorithm and which parts can I leave out? So this idea of how do I get something that reflects reality enough to be useful and yet is minimal enough that I can actually do something with it. I can come up with an algorithm. I can, so it's that part of physics. It's that abstraction. And in EECS, there are also abstractions. So I, I kind of, I like the abstractions and I think the abstractions are sometimes, we need to have people who look at the real world, whether it be a physical system or a social system and abstract it into something where you might be able to come up with an algorithm. You might be able to do something. And I love that process of abstraction. Now, that doesn't have to be everybody's thing. You know, that's what I love. And so I find places for it. You might love something different about EECS. And that's really cool too. And Juno, what do you want to do when you graduate? Um, right now, I'm thinking of either um, going straight to startups or finding a job before that. It depends, really. Um, but right now, I'm focusing on um, practicing interviewing um, for possibly getting a job um, next year. Cool. Well, good luck with that. I got to tell you, you are a Cal Eeks major. You are going to have people just breaking down your door to hire <laughs> So know that even if it's kind of scary sometimes interviewing, remember you're just fine. And if you feel you're a little insecure about it, that's your head. That's not the way people are viewing you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Uh huh. Wow. I feel like I'm. Um, I, I have the pleasure of being on a talk show with uh, advice. It makes me happy. Peter, <laughs> come on on. I hope you can. Uh, Hello no, there. Somewhere fun. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. I have a, a tiny bit bad internet because I'm in Nicaragua right now and it's like 10 megabytes per second. So <laughs> let me know if you can't hear me. Um, I love the energy. Thank you so much for uh, great advice. And I really thought it was interesting to hear how you juggle different passions. You put them on the shelf for a while and you return to them. And my question would be, because I feel like I have a lot of interest, but I can't really point at something and say, this is my passion. How do you differentiate from a, a, a passion from an interest? You know, it's, it's, um, it's a funny thing. I have found that I become passionate it, you know, I, I used to talk to my stepson a lot about this. He was talking about finding his passion and I said to him, what I invest myself in becomes my passion. So I have a lot of interests and I pour myself into something and then that becomes my passion. It's like um, you, you love something that you invest yourself in if you have an interest in it. And so choose something and invest yourself in it my guess is you'll probably become passionate and that can help you then, then you take the expertise you've developed there, the experience you've developed there and you can take it to the next thing. And again, invest yourself in that. So passion is, you know, um, uh, you know, it's almost like relationships. Okay. You can say, oh, I really like this person, but if I don't invest in that relationship, it doesn't become a really good relationship, a friendship, whatever. And in a similar way with your life's passions, they're what you invest in. 
but you don't have to, as I said before, shut the door on anything to invest in something now. Go for it. And you will find that over time, you will have more than one passion and you'll be able to move among them. Thank you so much. That was an mm -hmm. amazing answer. That's, that's wonderful. Um, Siddhartha, it would be great to get your question. Hi, yeah. My question was, um, you I loved what you said about how you don't have to close the door or, um, on, on a passion and or a topic, you save it for later. But how, do you, how did you who, um, sort of um, allow, get people to take you seriously in, um, when, when you want, decided to come back through that door? Or, um, I, 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 that's, that's what I'm usually very concerned about. Uh -huh. um, well, you know, it gets easier over time, but you see what I could do when I went back and started doing things in biology, you know, 30 years later, well, I had a lot of expertise I could bring to the table. I was really ignorant. I mean, you know, what people knew about biology 30 years earlier is like a joke now, right? Um, and with everything, I, you know, I started working with economists, okay? And I think like market design and everything is really fascinating. I started working with them. So I couldn't bring the economic intuition or knowledge, but I could bring something to the table that they didn't have, that they were interested in. I could bring the mathematics. I could bring a little bit of the computer science. So I think that, you know, you, it, you go back and there's a lot of interdisciplinary work. I heard from Victoria that you guys are talking about interdisciplinary things. And so many of the problems of our time in biomedicine and health, in climate change, in social justice, are deeply interdisciplinary problems. So you become, you know, an, an expert in something and then you bring it and somebody else comes and they bring in something else. So I, I think that's how it happens. You kind of, sometimes people talk about being a T, that you're deep in one thing and then you have some knowledge of other things. So don't just, there's a tendency to say, oh, all I want to do is take more electives in my major and not be enough of a T that you'll be able to start talking to other people later in life when you get a chance. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. I'm going to take two more questions now, and then I'm hoping we can kind of switch over. And I think I'll come in the questions to what you're focused on now, uh, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. So Rita, do you want to ask your question? Yes. Um, hi. Uh, can people hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Just awesome. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, I have a little, like, I have really spotty Wi-Fi, so. No um, I'm just curious because you mentioned that your hobby is to overwork, although it is, like, kind of, like, jokingly, but it's also, like, true. I'm just curious, like, what is, like, a typical day in your life like? Like, how much time do you spend, like, daily or weekly on work and how much time you spend on like maybe exploring your under interests? Okay, so I am in startup mode since I landed here. Okay, <laughs> so I'm working like I'm doing a startup. I'm in startup mode. I'm being an entrepreneur, okay? There's a lot that has to be built. We have a, a brand new division, okay? And we're really building it. So there have been times when I went and formed my first lab in Cambridge, Massachusetts for Microsoft. I, you know, worked nonstop on that. When I first got to Microsoft 11 years before then, I, you know, there, there are times where you say, wow, um, this is hard, but I'm going to look back and say, I can't believe we worked together and we made this happen in such a short amount of time. So uh, right now I'm really in startup mode. I mean, right now I'm probably working 12 hours a day during the week and um, 
you know, weekdays and maybe <laughs> eight hours a day on weekends, six to eight hours a day on weekends. It's insane. Okay, you don't have to be like me. Um, and then there are other periods in my life when I step back and I'm more reflective and I'm more, you know, before coming here, for several years, I was going through a period and I was doing a lot for Microsoft, but I was going through a period of thinking, what is the next thing to do? What, 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 is, what are the problems in the world and how can I have an impact on them? And let me step back from them and let me be more reflective. So I think there are, you know, it's, it's almost like interval training. <laughs> so I'm on the, I'm on the, you know, I'm, I'm on the treadmill right now, going at a fast speed. And then I go at slower speeds at other times, if that makes any sense. If yeah, you do a startup, you. you'll get this, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not sleeping under your desk yet. No, I'm not so well, I'm not leaving my house. It's just yeah. crazy. You know, I had seven weeks from the time I got here to the time the world shut down. <laughs> so uh, a lot of a lot of Zoom rooms. Um, and yeah, a lot of Zoom rooms. <laughs> um, Sam Oyerly, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name last name correctly, but Sam, you have a question. I do, uh, and that's the German pronunciation. Um, so kudos to you. Um, hi, Dr. Chase, my name's Sam. Uh, Yearly is the American way, so a little less interesting. Um, but thank you for spending your evening with us. My question is, I would love to know how you define success for yourself and if that definition has changed over time. Uh, it has changed, it has changed. Um, I think it has changed so how I define success for myself is creating something new. You know, it's very interesting. I just had a wonderful conversation which will be published with, um, with President Drake, with the president of UC. And uh, the interviewer was asking him about leadership and in the context of data and how he uses data as a leader and he said, Leaders are people who change things. So he said, leaders are people that don't have anyone to follow because it hasn't been done before. And uh, I really agree with him there. Okay, so that is, I try, I try to create new things. So for me, that has always been success, creating something that was not quite there before. Over time though, um, a bigger and bigger measure of my success is what have I enabled other people to be able to do? And how has this created kind of opportunities for them to do things that no one has done before? For more, you know, when I started, it was just, can I create something? Maybe working with a couple of other people, but can I create something? And over time it has become, what can I seed that will allow others to create? Okay, so it's, you know, and that's the way you have much bigger impact, of course. That's a wonderful answer. Thank you so much. Uh, I actually, um, as you are creating, I am curious to know how, <laughs> how it came about that you are at Berkeley, how it came about that you are creating the CDSS, how it came about that suddenly like EECS, um, uh, School of Information, statistics are all coming together. Uh, and, and maybe if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so, you know, I had a great gig at Microsoft. <laughs> it was really great. I, I had so many people whom I had handpicked and it was wonderful and we had all this interdisciplinary work, but um, it was missing a couple of things for me. It was missing the opportunity to help educate the next generation. I mean, I did during that time have lots of grad students and postdocs I worked with, probably a couple of hundred over the 23 years, but not on the scale at which we can do it here. And also really um, having the broad array of talent that we have on this campus to really begin to look 
at how we might move the dial on the most urgent problems of our time. Uh, you know, and, and we have that here. And yet, um, so actually at the time at which I chose to come here, there were about seven places that were looking for leaders in similar roles. It was just amazing. So the world is seeing that computing and data science are becoming the media by which we interact with each other and communicate with each other. I think, um, I think now, uh, you know, since <laughs> that first debate, when we decided not to have our conversation, we have seen the effects of social media play out in even more profound ways than we had seen them before. Uh, so really computing, information, data science are at the core of so much of the opportunities and the challenges we face as a society. And to be able to come here, um, help to create and support educational programs that would um, enable many, many more students to be able to approach data masterfully and ethically, um, to inoculate them against misinformation, to have them really think critically about it was huge. But also, um, you know, I, I had worked <laughs> in my last couple of years at Microsoft on cancer immunotherapy and climate change and ethical decision making. Okay. And I could do little things there. Here, uh, I've heard that of our 1,500 faculty, 400 say that they have either worked on climate change or they want to work on climate change. Now, climate change has many different aspects to it. It has, you know, engineering, it has materials, it has synthesis, it has environmental science and all kinds of other STEM disciplines. It also has human dimensions to it. In fact, uh, one of our faculty, Bill Collins, who is a co-author on the IPCC re reports, which are these big climate change reports that come out every few years, says the biggest uncertainty we have is not in the physical models, it is in human behavior. So how do we, how can we come to a place like Berkeley and see people thinking about climate induced migration like we see in Bangladesh, uh, creating geopolitical destabilization as large numbers of people have to move from one area to another. How do we take all of that? How do we think about the political, geopolitical ramifications, the economics of it? If we don't get the incentives right, we can have the most incredible alternative energy sources and yet not adopt them. So, you know, Berkeley is a place that has expertise in all of this. So how do we create environments? How do we create fertile ground for people to come together and begin collectively to try to impact these, you know, these urgent problems of our time? In fact, problems that will be um, increasingly urgent for the students in this class. It opened with an appeal that people should participate something involving climate change. And now, and now we are also in a time where we have social upheaval, we have racial injustice. We, in computing and data science and information, we have media that if we are, if we are not careful, exacerbate inequality unintentionally. You design an algorithm, you don't allow it to use race or gender, but it finds proxies and it delivers results that are actually really much worse than human judgments. That's unintentional. Or you have QAnon say, oh, this is a powerful medium. How do we take this computing medium of communication and usurp that power for our ends. So, you know, these are central, central questions in social and racial justice. 
our educational system, our public health system, our social welfare system, our criminal justice system are all moving towards algorithmic platforms. So it is, yeah. There is so much to be done. I happen to have a freshman in, in college and she is so worried about the future. And we've had questions um, from students from last year. Like there's so much, uh, so much to be concerned about. When you think about what you're trying to do and how you're trying to bring people together, I'm just curious, can you see any like wins on the horizon in terms of prioritizing some of these huge areas and, and focusing on that and what you might be able to help push from the university? Yeah, so I think, well, you know, I start out with about seven or eight areas and we're down to three priority areas, biomedicine and health. We are actually right now building a joint program with UCSF in computational precision health. So really excited about that. Um, then there is uh, climate change and we are, we are trying to come up with what we would like to architect is an open platform for climate science and climate research. Mm -hmm. And then we are also looking at questions of criminal justice. We have some faculty in the law school, uh, uh, Rebecca Wexler and um, Andrea Roth, who are concerned about the disparities we have between the resources of the prosecutors and the resources of the defenders, the public defenders in criminal justice cases. We have a young professor in EECS, ready to Bebe, who is working with them to be able to challenge uh, algorithms that are being used to convict people and put them on death row, used beyond the levels at which they were tested. So how do we build platforms that not only enable this to happen, but when it happens, enable it to be shared with public defenders around the country whose clients are being um, are being convicted in similar ways. So, you know, there, there is so much that we can do on, and it's already starting to happen. And so what I see the role of CDSS is to enable this, to try to go out and get funding to support these endeavors, to, um, to create these new fields in which I'm hoping that many of our students will be the young leaders of these new fields, of these fields of algorithmic justice, for example, or you know this very data-driven approach to climate change, integrating the heterogeneous data from the science and the economics and the human behavior. So I really see it as our job to help seed these fields and create the next generation of leaders who are gonna lead in these fields. Um, you said something in an interview that I'd listened to previously that I've never heard a, um, a Dean say, uh, and that is um, that you will feel successful if um, CDS, uh, CDSS, CDSS. CDSS um, has a class, a collaborative class with every single department. I think that is how Well, so what I said was that I want to have shared faculty with every single department and school on campus. If we do not have that, okay, then we are going to have missed an opportunity because there is just, there, there are computing and information and statistics and data science aspects of every other field, you may say ethics. Of course, ethics is helping us to figure out what our algorithms should look like. You may say humanities, there's digital humanities and digital arts, but will the arts help us to frame AI in a way that is more beautiful and that is fairer? And so every, you name for me a department or a school, and I will name for you an agenda that we should be building with them. We need to have joint faculty, and then we need to be able to train students who will be the future leaders in this. So students normally are at school for four years. Mm -hmm. um, 
and and or or six or or seven or eight, depending on I guess what your plan is. If I am so inspired from hearing you speak right now and I want to do something, I'm a history major, that's my background. What should I be looking at in the next year or two years? What classes should I be looking at taking that will make me an effective T as opposed to just, you know, the, the wide as opposed to the, the uh, deep? So it's interesting because the original division of data science was um, founded by two people, David Culler, who was in EECS, and Catherine Carson, who was in history. Oh. And, you know, she was a science historian and she is helping to write the thing that science historians will write about in the future, right? <laughs> um, so we have a class in the data science major on human context and ethics jointly with the history department. Okay. If we're going to be doing this, if these are gonna become the platforms by which we interact with each other, we need a historical perspective. I think what we lacked, what we're now trying to do is we interpret all that is unfolding after the insurrection is what was history trying to tell us? How did we miss it? What is it trying to tell us now? What should we be doing now? I want to open it up to the students, but I wanted to give you one more opportunity, Jennifer. Is there some thought you want to leave us with officially before you start answering questions? So uh, I, I really do believe that this nexus of the STEM disciplines and what I call the human center disciplines of, you know, social sciences, arts and humanities, and all of our professional schools, that computing and data science and information have to sit at this nexus if we are to build the world that we need to build. And Berkeley is incredibly well positioned to lead here. So this is what we want to do. And, um, you know, and I, I really, really hope that you know, many of you here will say, wow, yes, I see a leadership path for me in some aspect of this. And I wanna help lead, whether it's by doing a startup or whether it's by going in and revamping the way government is doing certain things to be much more data-driven while understanding the human aspects of it. There is so much that the people in this class can be doing to be the future leaders. And so I, I want you to embrace that. And I want you to have the confidence to run with that. Thank you. I don't know if you've noticed, but I think a number of uh, people in class are, are hoping to vote for you in some, some way, <laughs> thinking maybe you should run for office. Um, that was lovely. And now I'd really like to turn it over to the students uh, for questions. Uh, I see um, Faria, do you want to, we'll just go through um, questions until 630. <laughs> Faria, are you there? Yes, I am. Oh, there you are. I believe my question was on imposter syndrome and whether or not like it's still something you experience or like did it ever go away at one at what point did you truly feel confident in your passions or your positions i never feel truly confident okay i never feel truly confident i do feel more more used to being not confident Okay, it's like when the little voice says, oh, you don't know what you're doing. You're like way out ahead of yourself here. Um, another voice does say, thank you for sharing. You're probably gonna muddle through it just like you always have. Whereas, you know, it used to be in the past, oh my God, I'm gonna be caught right now. You know, this is gonna be it. Um, and so I do get more used to it, but you know, I'm always, I'm always, pushing myself outside of my comfort zone. I, that's just what I do. I put so anytime I could feel really knowledgeable and really secure, it's like, okay, that it's time to move. 
it's time to go out and do something else that needs to be done. And, um, you know, and, and so feeling the imposter syndrome, actually, even if you stay in the same field, you're just going to feel that way all the time anyway. So you might as well move to different fields and have a broader impact. <laughs> so when you learn to live with the imposter syndrome and keep going, it actually enables you to venture further. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you very much for the question, Martha. Hi, hello. Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm a I'm a French major, um, mm -hmm. only not within the field that we mm -hmm. are uh, talking about. Mm -hmm. But I it did catch my attention when you talked about. Um, I believe there was like an anthropologist that was hired for like a project, um, and I was like, oh, okay, there's a chance for the humanities majors to like you know get in um. on it. Um, what what are the roles that they usually held in your experience uh, working with people in the humanities field? So, I mean, there are lots of things that we can do with the humanities field. The, I, I, I did talk maybe in some other interview that I gave about an anthropologist um, whom we had hired in one of my labs, and she wanted to study gig workers. And she you know, she um, went to India for nine months and she was interviewing people on Amazon Turk and she discovered things that none of the people who were just looking at data had imagined could be happening. <laughs> and then she started working with someone in machine learning and they just found out there was this whole structure. There was this whole world there. They started, you know, testifying to congressional staff. She went to MacArthur. Um, in the, I don't know, like six months ago or something for her work. Um, you know, there are human dimensions to all of this. There really are. And there is a great pitfall if we try to come up with data-driven and algorithmic solutions without understanding the human dimensions behind them. We can miss the mark really really badly. So we have to have, so what do you want to do with your life, Martha, with your friend? What do you <laughs> oh boy. Want to um, do? So I, there's two uh, possible outcomes that I've been thinking about, um, either in translation, so something more linguistics related, mm -hmm. or uh, education, so uh, language teaching research. Uh-huh, uh -huh. well, okay, so here are some ideas for you. First of all, um, Translation, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's going on with machine translation now where someone who really understands the language has to, has to be training it. Because if a, if a computer scientist just goes off and does this, they're gonna miss all the subtleties. They're, they're gonna miss what makes you love the French language, okay? Also for teaching. So you might come up with a way of teaching and yet, there are going to be students who just, some students who get this quickly in this context or that context, others who don't. There are ways of using what's called reinforcement learning. It's a technique in machine learning to personalize it to the individual and to the context. So you can work with people who are developing these things to try to understand how do I teach French different aspects of French to different people or even to the same person at different times mm -hmm. and to allow them to really get it. So, um, and, and to enable them to experiment with it. And in all these cases, if you just have a computing statistics person, mm -hmm. you know, you miss the mark. You need the disciplinary expert to be able to do this. So those are just some examples for you. you Thank know? you, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Very okay. encouraging. Mm -hmm. It is wonderful for you to give those examples so we all know kind of how to start to think about it. So thank you. Kiana. Hi, it's lovely Hi. hearing from you. Um, I was actually also born in Tehran, Iran. Um, so love some representation. Um, <laughs> You talked a little bit about um, kind of using tech and data science and um, all these uh, technical tools to solve really big global problems. 
Um, I'm really passionate about environmental justice and social justice and the intersections of all of these things uh, with technology. I think a really big problem is that I'm a data science major, so I love data science and I think it definitely deserves uh, a role in change for the future, but I think uh, it's been emphasized quite a lot and I feel like there are some dangers to emphasizing the role of technology so so much, um, especially in the world of startups. Um, and I feel like a lot of technical majors these days don't get that interdisciplinary understanding of the impact that their work could one day have. So um, I would love to hear about, you know, how can we at Berkeley change our curriculum to um, better show ethics and the impact of technology to students? Because um, I feel like that's really lacking, especially in the College of Engineering. So that is one of the reasons that we formed the new division. It is precisely for that reason. You know, in the data science major, we've got human context and ethics, but you really, you really, really have to understand how the solutions can go wrong if you don't understand how they're being used by people and what their impact is on people. We talk now about foundations, applications, and implications. And the implications are really important. The implications of the technology can either be a force for good or a force for ill. There's another example like I came, I, I went over in a recent interview where um, there, were, um, there were economists who looked at data and came up with, um, with uh, uh, school choice algorithms. And they implemented them in the city of San Francisco where it was hoped that these school choice algorithms would allow kids from less well-off backgrounds to go to schools and other, and it would mix things and it would increase the, um, the, the, the quality of the inner city schools. And, it, and what happened was just the opposite. And it is because the people who were studying it didn't understand the folks who were going to be using that technology. They didn't understand the parents of the kids and how that, and so they finally, they stopped using it. And we, we have a, um, a woman, Neela Farsalehe, in the School of Information who won an award for showing what went wrong there. She went and she did anthropological interviews later. And now with someone in the Graduate School of Education, she is building a school matching school choice um, algorithm for the city of Oakland, which takes into account these things. So yes, I think um, data and math <laughs> can be dangerous things if we don't understand both the unintentional and the intentional misuses of them. And, you know, if there was ever a time to see the intentional misuses, you know, uh, look at January 6th, okay? <laughs> look at January 6th. And we need to see both the unintentional and the intentional misuses. And we have to build it better and there is no place better than Berkeley to do this. Uh, so, uh, I'm conscious that you have not even had a drink of water while I have. Jennifer, you want to take a drink of water as you're... Um, Kevin, I'm excited for your question also. Hello, uh, Professor. Thank you for coming and talking to us. Um, I am a math and econ major. Um, mm -hmm. So... I definitely share that passion for uh, problem solving that you have. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I mean, one of the many things that uh, impresses me about you is your, you know, long list of uh, research that, that you have and kind of the, uh, the, the vastness of different um, fields that you've researched in as well. Um, I'm assuming that there was, uh, you know, in the, in, in the many kind of opportunities that you had, um, I'm assuming there was one sort of field where you were a little bit outside your comfort zone. Um, and uh, I- All I, I of them, to... all of them except <laughs> now. All of them except now. 
Um, I, and I just wanted to know um, kind of what, uh, how do you kind of navigate, you know, being outside your comfort zone, especially when you're doing something so specialized? Um, and then kind of as an ancillary question, uh, I'm also a, I'm a huge punk rock fan and have been for a while and I've been kind of getting into it. So I just was wondering what are some of your favorite bands? <laughs> Okay, well, um, you know, I really like the the Clash were probably my favorite way back when. Yeah. So. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. And now um talking <laughs> talking more relevance to, to this. First of all, I think one of the best things you can do when you're outside of your comfort zone and you don't understand is don't pretend to understand. The moment I pretend to understand. I'm drowning. Okay. It's like, it doesn't take long from nodding when I don't understand to drowning. So I say, I'm sorry. I don't know anything about this. Can you explain this to me? Um, so I think it's, it's owning up and, um, you know, not knowing something doesn't mean you're not smart or not good or not able to make a contribution. And so I think really um, saying, and I, I have certain friends of mine who over the years, you know, we, we kid each other. I know less than you do. No, I know less than you do. No, I know less than you do. <laughs> Just because it's a really comfortable place to be, not claiming to be an expert on something you're not an expert on. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. And then you know, sometimes you go off and you learn a little bit yourself, but sometimes you go to seminars. I remember when I first went to grad school, um, you know, and I was coming from this little liberal arts school and I went to Princeton physics, you know, and, and, and I felt like when I went to seminars, I felt kind of like I was riding a horse and I had like nothing to hold on to. And I was like, oh my God. And it would be like two minutes and then I'd fall off. And then later lectures, oh my God, I went five minutes without falling off the horse. I mean, I went five minutes with understanding what they were saying. And I went seven minutes and, that, and then all of a sudden, oh my, I, I think I might have actually understood something here. Or at least like the question I asked, like somebody else said, oh, you understood that. How did you understand that? And it's like, did I? I didn't realize that. So I think there's just um, being exhilarated by the, the wild ride of not understanding and getting more and, and, and learning more and more rather than embarrassed and hiding it. Uh, I think, you know, and just know this happens with everybody. It happens with everyone. Nobody is born an expert in anything, okay? And, and that's okay. That's really okay. And by the way, math and economics, oh my God, there is... <laughs> There's so much to be done there. So we are talking about forming um, this group within CDSS on economics and computation. There is so much that is going on in this society that is really markets that are, um, it, you know, there are market imbalances that are leading to uh, all kinds of negative effects, even that criminal justice thing we were talking about. You know, there's a market imbalance there. You have all the, the all the resources going to the prosecutors and not to the public defender. So how do you build a platform that 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 enables people and that tries to even out that market? Okay. And there are there are so Mike Jordan, who um, Science Magazine called the Mike Jordan of computer science. There's a guy named Mike Jordan in our computer science department who's kind of legendary. And he is talking about the fact that we need market-aware machine learning and machine learning-aware markets. And this is just going to be a huge area. So uh, there are startup opportunities. There's deep scholarship opportunities, there are policy opportunities. It's just, it's such a cool area to be in. You're really lucky. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that question, Jennifer. We have about eight more questions um, that have come up and I'm very conscious of your time. Um, are you able to stay until like 6.35? Yeah, sure, sure. 
That's kind of you. And I'm also putting up, uh, we have a passcode every week where we have uh, feedback for our speakers. So I'm going to put that up and then I'm going to ask Salman, I think, uh, if you would ask your question. I think that's uh, who's next. Yes. Hello. Um, I'm also a Persian immigrant. So your story was really uh. inspiring and heartwarming. Um, and I'm currently working on a startup with my team and, you know, sometimes like things get very rough, you know, a lot of challenges and obstacles. And I always call my grandpa for asking, like, you know, give me motivation. So <laughs> I love that as well. Like, you know, um, I just wanted to know your thinking process and how do you stay persistent? <sighs> um, I find it easier to stay persistent for other people, okay? Sometimes I'm trying to do something and there's obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. And so if I were just doing it for myself, I would be out of there. <laughs> but I'm not just doing it for myself. I'm doing it for somebody else. I'm doing it for my partners. I'm doing it for my students. I'm doing it, I mean, this, this is just me personally. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm better. I was always better at like uh, standing up for my students or the people I mentored <laughs> more than I was in, you know, asking for higher salaries or something for myself. You know, in, in fact, in fact, um, I find that one of the best ways to be assertive about what I need is to be mentoring people. <laughs> and and if they're not getting what they need, then uh, you tell them they have to ask. And then I kind of get embarrassed that, <laughs> that I'm not asking. But I, I, I have, to, sometimes I just have to do it for, for other people. That's, you know, that's who I am. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um. Chuck, I thought had an interesting question. Chuck? Yeah, so my question was, so uh, when you were working on Microsoft, what was like, a piece of advice or something you learned from Bill Gates that really like resonated with you and s sticks with you today? Um, well, you know, um, what I learned from Bill Gates, from interacting with Bill Gates, Bill didn't usually like give advice. You just, you saw how Bill acted. Um, and, and interacted. I think um, if you know you're right, persist. Be sure of yourself, but then persist. Don't let somebody intimidate you out of something that you know is, is right. Um, so I think that that's, that's really, really Im important. Um, and just in interacting with Bill, there were times when you know, like I, or actually my, my husband, who's an ex professor here, really disagreed with Bill. And, and it's like, everyone's like looking like, oh my, you're telling Bill he's wrong. <laughs> How can you do that? And of course, Bill and Steve Ballmer respected you a lot more for that. If, if you were right and you stuck to your guns. So, you know, so I think that that's part of it too, just knowing when you're right and not letting someone dissuade you. And, and, you know, Bill is legendarily persistent. So I think learning persistence from Bill, following something that you know to be the right course is, um, is something that I've seen in him. I think we are gonna go with our last question. Rishi, who, who will have the honor? Yeah, I guess like Ying, you can go next. Ying has a time sensitive question. Thank you. Um, so, hi, I'm right now in China. So my internet connection is not so good. So I'm gonna stop the video. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so uh, I'm having my very first internship interview upcoming tomorrow and it's with Apple and I'm like super stressed out because it's such a big company and it's my first time and I feel really like underprepared because I used to be a data uh, sorry I used to be a poli sci major and I always thought about doing like political activism 
but it, so it wasn't until like my third year in college I decided to switch to data science mm -hmm. so I feel like I'm kind of left behind compared to students who like know how to code since the middle school so I'm wondering like what advice would you give for my interview tomorrow okay well first of all what position are you interviewing for do you know so it's a software engineering position but it's on like a data science team and the job description seems more like related to like data processing and data visualization and that analysis so you're probably good at that huh i i hope so uh-huh uh-huh so yeah, let me I'll tell you something i took one coding class <laughs> um in 1974 or 75 okay that was it you know i taught myself everything after that I mean, you were not, even though I was doing math in my head as a kid, you look, you know, you're, they probably would not be interviewing you unless you look pretty good. Also, the fact that you were in poli sci and that you've thought about activism and other things um, means that you have certain leadership qualities, I would imagine, that, um, that are actually going to, make you fare very well. So I, you know, um, come on, you're a, you're a Cal data science. This is the number one data science program in the country. We were rated by US News and World Report number one. Mm -hmm. You are gonna be fine and realize that they're not hearing the little voice which keeps telling you that you're not good enough. They're, they're not hearing it, okay? You're hearing it, they're not hearing it. And, you know, so I would just, I would be honest about what I know and what I don't know. And, you know, um, and, and I think you're, you're gonna do just fine. I really do, but just, and let me tell you one other thing. If you don't get this one, you're going to get another great one. So it's not as if, if you don't get this one, you're going to fall off a cliff, okay? That was a great thing about dropping out of high school for me. I had picked myself out of this huge, huge, huge hole, okay? So what it meant, and I think unfortunately today, people are so perfect that they just, they get everything and then they're scared they're not going to get one thing. And I think you are going to get this. But also the other thing I find is that sometimes when I don't get something I want, it almost always happens that what I get is better. I just have to wait, okay? I just have to wait. Almost like, wow, how did that happen? I didn't get that thing I really, really, really wanted. And it left room for the thing that was gonna be the most amazing. So I, you know, so I don't want you to go into it feeling like you, you know, it's this or nothing, okay? And you are really, really good. This is what, you know, this is what my first father-in-law taught me. He was a Harvard Law School professor and I had a mom who couldn't add fractions or spell anything. And he said to me, you know, you think you're putting something over on other people? The real joke is on you. You actually are good. And I didn't know what he was talking about, but, um, you know, but I probably was okay. Thank you. So uh, tomorrow before I start my interview, I will be telling myself the joke is on me if I'm thinking that I'm underqualified. And if I fail, I will get something better. You will. You will. So you will. And you should know that I feel the same way you do before I go into something that I really want. Okay. I feel the same way. Do you think I'm unqualified? No. Okay. Okay. So these voices don't always know what they're talking about, okay? Right, okay. thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Jennifer Chase, that is advice not only for Ying, but all of us. Thank you for being so real, uh, so data rich um, and such a pleasure. Thank you from all the students and from myself and we wish you a wonderful evening. I will post that password one more time. Uh, and I just, uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, I'm posting the password one more time for everybody. You can find the attendance
quiz on B courses. Um, I really appreciate the great, great questions and, um, and the willingness to ask them. Uh, please keep that up as we go through the semester. We'll do varying forms of, uh, of lectures next week. Adam Chire, the co-founder of Siri and Change.org and Bixby is going to be doing some magic tricks for us, uh, talking about the secret to entrepreneurial success in three acts of magic.